Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on our uh, new weekly uh, RF uh, training and Q&A webinar series. Uh, today, we've got a really interesting topic, uh, distributed antenna systems, uh, also known as multi-zone uh, wireless systems. And we've got a great uh, industry expert with us today, Jason Glass. Uh, he's a very experienced RF system designer and uh, RF frequency coordinator from Clean Wireless Audio. Uh, he's going to walk us through a presentation and um, please feel free to submit your your questions and we will run through uh, q a at the end so jason uh, over to you uh, thanks chris uh thanks everybody for joining us uh, i hope everyone's uh passing the time well and uh, everybody's healthy your families are good so uh yeah let's let's dive right in you know uh in professional audio, distributed antenna systems, or what we call DAS, usually refers to a system of separate antenna covered zone inputs that are combined at a head end and then distributed to receivers. Um, this is somewhat similar to an audio mixing console where multiple mic inputs are subject to processes like gain or attenuation, they're mixed together and then subsequently routed to various outputs that feed other devices. Uh, there are newer DAS technologies such as audio over IP wireless node systems. Uh, they're becoming really common in wireless intercom, uh, but they are rare for microphones. Uh, but these, those consist of multiple independent transceiver units that are networked together with data cables. Uh, rather than connected via RF transmission lines. So there's a, there's a lot of differences there. Uh, the biggest one would be that in a, a audio over IP network, you, you really want a lot of overlap between your transceivers and antennas um, because they're handing off to each other and they're, they're doing a lot of processing that shifts frequencies and things that we're not really talking about here. We're, we're talking about a straight up uh, combined radio frequency signal. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the concept of, of DAS for microphone systems. Uh, uh, most of these concepts that we're gonna talk about, they apply to both receive and transmit DAS, but transmit DAS for in-ear monitors or IFB uh, have a lot of additional complications that re you really need advanced skills to manage them. Uh, it's very easy to mess up your audio signal when you try to use multiple transmitter antennas. Uh, so for now, we're just going to focus on the receiving end. Um, a diversity receiver alone in itself is technically a type of DAS because it utilizes two antennas that converge to a single device. Uh, but it is helpful to think of each dual antenna diversity receiver as a single subsystem in a larger distributed system. Uh, the fine distinction between a DAS and a diversity receiver is that a diversity pair of antenna inputs isn't really electrically combined together inside the receiver. It's either toggle switched from A to B or one of the, uh, each one of the pair feeds a discrete internal, uh, a pair of discrete internal receivers uh, whose audio output is then switched or cross-faded or summed for uninterrupted audio output. Um, uh, today's pro audio DAS usually consists of electrically combined antenna input signals that are then fed into receivers. Uh, so, you know, why would I use a DAS? Why would I want to make it that complicated? Uh, here we have on the left a small auditorium or house of worship that has attached rooms. Uh, and you know, as general best practice, you would want to start out trying to attempt to cover all of your areas with a single set of antennas, a diversity A and a diversity B. Uh, in this example on the right, we locate those antennas at a front of house position in a corner of the room near our mic receivers. Uh, and they're shown here in the lower left of the main room. Uh, it's, this example is a, a pair of log periodic dipolar array antennas known as LPDAs, or we call them paddles. Uh, 
uh, with, and they have cardioid po polar pattern, just like a cardioid microphone. And, you know, it looks like it might theoretically cover the area just fine. But when we find through testing or calculations or educated guessing that the structures will shield and isolate desired performance areas and attenuate signals, we can add a zone of coverage, creating a, a, a DAS system. Uh, the left here, you could see the walls are shielding uh, and you get reduced uh, antenna coverage outside those walls, but we might want to cover this small classroom at the bottom. Uh, so we add uh, uh, a second zone here with another pair of paddles in this separate room and connect them back to our system location with coax cable or uh, in some cases RF over fiber. We, we'll get to that later. Uh, the simplest way to create those zones is with all passive compo components, such as passive antennas, coax cables, passive combiners. Uh, this example is a non-diversity two-zone received DAS, with each zone RF isolated from the other. So this would be separate rooms, maybe across a campus, but the two areas, they're isolated. Uh, you wouldn't use this uh, uh, non-diversity setup for uh, receiving mobile transmitter applications like microphones because uh, diversity systems are more reliable. They're designed for that function. Uh, but setups like this are often used with intercoms uh, where they're not diversity uh, and they can work for static point to point links if you're doing stuff like that. Uh, I feel that it's best to select antennas that have enough passive gain to overcome the system's exact cable loss and combiner loss, that path between the antenna and the receiver. Uh, we're going to show you what you need to know, and we'll provide uh, a free software tool that can help you figure out gains and losses with a fair amount of precision. Uh, and for what it's worth, you could reverse this example that you're looking at here uh, you could reverse the signal flow from a transmitter for a simple transmitter distribution. Uh, but as I said before, there, there are caveats with that. Uh, this is the simplest representation of a two-zone setup, uh, a diversity setup, two-zone diversity setup with passive components. Uh, each zone is fully covered by two antennas. Again, we call them diversity A and diversity B. And uh, although not shown here, uh, we like to label these A1 and B1 in zone one, A2 and B2 in zone two, et cetera, you know, on and on for however many zones you have. Uh, it is poor practice to use a single set of diversity A and diversity B antennas to cover separate isolated zones. Uh, diversity systems are designed to have both antennas cover each zone uh, with overlapping gain patterns. A and B should overlap. Uh, there are exceptions to this. And of course, anything that gets you through the show in an emergency is fine. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's always, you know, smart to begin by using best practices and try to do it right. Uh, active multi-zone systems make up for system losses with internal amplification. Uh, and they allow you to do things like use longer coax cables, uh, use lower gain antennas such as omnidirectionals. Uh, they can send 12 volt DC bias down coaxial cables to power active inline components and antennas. Uh, a lot of these allow you to individually attenuate zones or switch zones on and off. Uh, uh, these active systems let you deploy large numbers of input zones. If you have many rooms you want to cover or many different spaces or they're distant, they're far apart. Uh, and uh, a lot of these systems uh, are, have built-in splitters to split out to more receivers. Uh, so you use fewer individual devices 
to get from a number of zone antennas to a number of receivers in your rack. Um, and, you know, these systems, we could scale them up or down to cover huge areas uh, with a centralized set of receivers. Uh, in the example on the left, uh, it covers multiple areas of Universal Studios in Orlando, uh, where we were asked to provide continuous coverage of performers driving go-karts through the park uh, and also cover musical acts on a dedicated outdoor performance stage. And they were all linked to a rack of receivers inside a sound stage uh, where our main show was. Uh, if, you're really, if you really carefully design a system like this, uh, they, can, they can do the opposite. Uh, I, I shouldn't say the opposite. The other application would be like one on the right uh, where you can add reliability to a smaller space uh, that isn't, it's not isolated zones, but we absolutely have to have rock solid operation in all corners of this room. Uh, uh, on the right, that's a theater where we broadcast live uh, to international broadcast uh, after a Super Bowl. Uh, the performer's mics in this case, uh, they we could not have them drop out when the performers left their performance spots on stage and roamed into the audience bleachers. So uh, we built a DAS to cover that. Um, and then of course, these, uh, uh, I should mention that uh, act uh, active antennas can drive hundreds of feet of low loss cable. Uh, there are other options. Uh, later, we'll discuss why we try to avoid active antennas and choose passive devices whenever we can. Uh, this example is a huge system that uses lots of RF over fiber. Uh, RF, R, RF over fiber can travel for miles uh, with very little loss, uh, but it's highly susceptible to overload uh, at the front end. Uh, it requires a lot of really careful fiber management uh, and care. I mean, you, use, you need to make sure your connectors are super clean. We use microscopes uh, and analyzers. Uh, but anyway, uh, you can think of a poorly deployed active multi-zone DAS system uh, as an audio console with all of the mic inputs wide open. Uh, and if you think of it that way, you could think, well, the output mix of that audio console with all your mics wide open. It'll have low signal to noise ratio and individual sources won't sound coherent or focused. Uh, in a DAS, the more signal paths that are combined, the more we have to optimize each one to keep the total system RF noise low. Uh, in really large systems, lots of zones, we, we have to use every trick in the book to keep them RF quiet and maximize carrier to noise ratio. Uh, in RF, a carrier is your desired radio signal. Everything else is noise. Uh, RF techs, we, we obsess over CNR because it's, it's a crucial factor to a reliable link. Uh, all of the following topics that we're about to do add up to high CNR and more reliability of this system. Uh, Diversity reception is what makes Pro Audio DAS work so well. Uh, to put it simply, uh, when one diversity antenna path, or we call them sides, one diversity side drops out, the other takes over. Uh, modern high-end receivers are excellent at silently switching back and forth from A to B. Uh, low and mid-end systems, sometimes not so much. Uh, I remember uh, Don touched on this when he was talking about the uh, diversity fin that uh, when when those when they they found that when they set up some systems where there was lots of switching back and forth to A to B it was causing causing some audio trouble uh, that's not as that's not really a problem with high end high end systems the expensive ones uh, but your your low end budget stuff you can have those kinds of problems. So you might want to consider avoiding DAS with low-end receivers. Uh, you might rather try deploying duplicate receivers to the different areas and manually cross-fading their audio signals. 
Um, but when deploying a DAS, our goal is to manage diversity coverage overlap of e uh, antenna overlap and uh, to manage zone coverage isolation where zone to zone, you don't have a lot of overlap. Uh, with a diversity system, A should overlap B in a given zone. A should be isolated from A in different zones and B should be isolated from B in different zones. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to mention too that uh, Sure Quadversity right now is the only self-contained true DAS in a receiver box that I know of. Uh, it, it's really the most advanced one right now uh, uh, and it really rocks, uh, but it is expensive for audio channel. Uh, Don also mentioned last week that, uh, well, I, I jumped ahead. So when we build these systems, there's a number of critical parameters and things we have to consider uh, about the gear, about the deployment, the environment. Uh, starting with the gear, uh, we want to be sure that we maintain a good impedance match from device to device throughout our system uh, because in, uh, mismatched impedance causes a reflection of signal back in the direction that it came from. Uh, a mismatched component inserted into a system has a reflection point at each port or at each end. Uh, filter circuits depend on impedance matching to achieve their uh, desired properties and they'll detune if connected to a, a mismatched impedance. So it can defeat the normal function of the box you're plugging it into. Um, uh, port isolation also, it, it makes sure that the signal flows from one port to the desired ports with as little leakage as possible to undesired ports. Uh, it, is, it makes sure that your signal flows as, as you intend in the direction you intend, wasting as little as possible. Uh, it, also, uh, con uh, it also prevents local oscillator leakage between devices, which is harmful. Uh, all your receivers have uh, oscillators inside them. They're, they're sitting there doing their thing, and that, that oscillator is a reference for all the circuitry inside it. Some of that can leak out of that device. Uh, you, when you connect that device or a number of those devices to uh, uh, devices that have poor, poor port isolation, that local oscillator can, uh, signal can leak from device to device, and that's very harmful. Um, so we also want to really pay attention to RF amplification. Uh, it's both our friend and foe, you know. Uh, it, it can really help or it can bite you bad. Uh, and we're referring here to amplification within our DAS and receiver circuitry, rather than talking about the transmitter amplification, uh, amplification or transmitter power. Uh, we're really just talking about inside our DAS system. Uh, the amplification has to be as linear as possible. Uh, and, and perfect linearity is impossible, as we know, uh, but modern systems get close enough when they're below their overload threshold. Uh, as soon as you blast the input of that thing with just a little bit more power than it can handle, uh, it becomes very harmful uh, to the signal. Everything distorts and you end up with lots of noise and things drop out. Uh, so the best practice is to use as little amplification as necessary for a given purpose. Uh, it's important when you're, it, like, it's always best practice to really understand gain patterns and, and how to deploy them for even a simple system. But uh, I think what you're going to see as we move on here is what I'm hammering here is that with a DAS, you're, you're, you've got so many sources of energy converging that even small uh, uh, deviations from optimal when, you, when you're doing it that many times, it adds up to a lot more damage to your signal. So, uh, so we wanna understand our, our antenna gain patterns 
and select the you know appropriate antennas for the spaces we need to cover. Uh, and the most common antennas in pro audio, they have similar patterns to microphones, uh, omni, cardioid, hypercardioid. Uh, and just as you'd select and place a hypercardioid mic to pick up a snare drone and reject a hi-hat, select an antenna that fully but only covers the desired space in each of your zones. Uh, and again, remember, best practice for diversity antenna overlap and zone isolations. We want A to overlap B, A isolated from A, B isolated from B. And uh, we're going to show you some detailed antenna gain pattern information before we're done here. Uh, so each signal path, as I said, should be optimized. Uh, it's easy when you have an appropriate calculator program and you know the published specs of each component in the path. And fortunately, with the internet, we can find out all that information and we could find those calculators and I'm gonna give you one. Uh, RF noise should be kept low as possible at every stage. Uh, I, I, this may be repeating myself, but you know, the bigger and more complex the system, the more critical each component specs become. Uh, we'll explore some techniques and tools to mitigate noise and maximize CNR. Uh, and one thing we're going to touch on before we leave uh, is that we, we, we can't equate DAS antenna cover zones with frequency, uh, frequency coordination software zones. And uh, I'll explain why when we get to that section. Uh, so now that we've touched on all those individual considerations, we'll, we'll start to dive deep into each one. Uh, the proper devices for splitting and combining RF signals are all specially designed devices with very precise tuned internal components. Uh, most often these will be what we call Wilkinson power dividers, uh, and that's what's inside what most wireless mic manufacturers and antenna accessory manufacturers uh, make. Um, the best quality versions of these each have around three and a half dB of insertion loss. Uh, and that's more than half of the power of the input signal that's lost. Uh, sometimes we can use resistive types, but they have higher loss, which is usually undesirable. Uh, but they're, they're very inexpensive and they have really wide bandwidth. So once in a great while, we'll select one of those if it fits our purposes. Um, so all of the devices you see here, except one, they have, they exhibit a good 50 ohm impedance match and they have high port to port isolation, which is usually means better than 20 decibels or, or, or in that range. Uh, that cheapy coax T is an abomination that only belongs in nightmares. <laughs> it has enormous impedance mismatch. It has no port isolation. It has no heart, no soul, and can't see itself in a mirror because it's a signal vampire. So don't use them, guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, passive large systems can, of course, be perfect in many situations, uh, especially in lower frequency ranges such as VHF. Uh, and that's because cable losses over distance are lower at lower frequencies. And in VHF, we might have a surplus of system gain to work with. So uh, losing three and a half dB to a, a splitter or combiner might not hurt us in that design. Uh, but active DAS head ends are usually a good choice because they're, they're simple, you know, they're simple to integrate into your design. They're, they're usually pretty simple to use. Uh, and they're especially helpful when you need more than just like two zones. Uh, these devices uh, generally shoot for unity gain from input to output. So that's really helpful. Um, they become pretty necessary when you're working in high UHF bands uh, where cable losses are greater over distance and you can't afford more splitter or combiner loss. Um, and, you know, sometimes just having the option of a second input zone, uh, it can be a lifesaver if you're on location. Uh, you know, uh, all those times you hear, oh, by the way, a couple minutes before production requires you to 
uh, have a mic walk seamlessly from across a football field and down into a tunnel and back into the dressing rooms. You know, just having one more zone, you know, if you put it down into the bomb, you, that might just totally work. So just having the option is great. Uh, and larger scale systems that have four or more zones, uh, it's really helpful to have additional features like uh, individual input attenuation or on off switching on each antenna input. That's very helpful. And I'll get into that in more detail later as well. Uh, and I wanted to mention that uh, I prefer to use components that don't have too many more ports than what we actually need. Uh, a spare pair or two is generally okay, but I, I wouldn't ever purposely choose, say, a, 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 an eight-way antenna splitter when I only need four. Uh, same on the inputs. I, I wouldn't want to choose a, uh, an eight-input uh, multi-zone head end when I only need three. So that's something to consider, uh, and the reason is uh, active DAS head ends in pro audio uh, generally use a network of internal passive combiners. And then on the other end, the active receiving antenna splitters use internal passive splitters. Uh, although there are some exceptions, uh, RF Venue has a new product, uh, Distro 9 HDR, uh, and, and it's a different topology, but most of them have some variant of two by two by two until the desired number of ports is achieved. Uh, and each two-way cascade ca causes at minimum 3 dB a loss. Uh, and this, uh, this has to be made up with amplification. Um, and this scales up or down with simple arithmetic to achieve the desired number. Uh, you see uh, in the graphic 3 dB in two cascades ends up being 90, or in three cascades end up, ends up being 9 dB a loss. Um, and that works, works in both directions, whether combining or splitting, it's the same. Uh, so, the, as I mentioned before, the, the reason I prefer fewer spare ports is that we want to use the least total amplification in the entire system to achieve unity gain or a small surplus at the inputs of each receiver. Uh, by reducing amplification, it also raises the threshold for overload conditions, usually, uh, and it generally keeps the internal noise floor as low as possible. Uh, and the highest quality and most expensive DAS systems, uh, head ends, uh, they, they'll have internal isolators at various stages, uh, they're pretty complex devices. They'll have isolators. They, they might have tunable filtering or variable attenuation and sometimes variable amplification. So that's where that big money goes in those larger systems. Um, so moving on to some of the physics of RF and, and stuff we, we need to know as we build these systems. Uh, we need to understand multipath interference pretty well because in a DAS, we're intentionally creating multiple signal paths. Uh, signal strength nulls in space are extremely difficult to predict. Uh, and it's really impossible to do that when the transmitters are always moving around. Uh, and because DAS signal paths, uh, with the exception of the free space portion, they're fixed in electrical length. And, and so they're, they're also interrelated to the signal wavelength. And that makes, that makes it so that there are some techniques that we can use to mitigate the destruction of signal because of multipath interference. Uh, this is a calculated model uh, of, it's two dimensional, uh, of an electromagnetic signal propagating in free space. Uh, it has no surfaces that are reflective to RF and it has no boundaries. Uh, the bullseyes in this image are measurement points that represent receiver antennas. Signal propagates away from the source and its amplitude attenuates over distance according to the inverse square law. Uh, 
uh, this is the same math that rules over all wave propagation in nature, uh, from dropping a stone in a pond to earthquakes to acoustics. Uh, you can see how it just fades out as it radiates. And the measurement points show that very simple relationship. But right here at the top, we just added a single reflective object to this very simple environment. And you can see right away that a complex pattern of constructive and destructive interference is caused. Uh, and now notice the differences in received signal, uh, signal strength at each measurement point. And if I toggle that back and forth, you can see how drastically they change in some cases. Um, and just in case you don't see it right away, uh, the grayish or, or uh, yellow grayish areas, those are destructive interference nulls. Uh, where a signal would drop out if a receiver antenna was in that area. Um, so when we combine two different antennas, we see on the lower right where they're superimposed. And uh, <laughs> this modeler, uh, it won't show the sum of those signals, but what we audio folks know about summing of shifted phase signals, we, we can clearly see that it'll be very destructive to the amplitude of that signal. Uh, they'll, they'll zero out. Uh, if they're if they're perfectly out of phase and they're perfectly uh, the same amplitude, they'll completely zero out. If the phase is shifted or the amplitudes are different, there'll be a, an attenuation, you know, a, a range. What there's a relationship there. Um, so here we've just moved the transmit antenna about a wavelength and a half away from the original. There's the original. There's the the moved antenna. And look at the big change in the in interference pattern just by moving that antenna a little bit. Uh, the measurements show how having at least two antennas at different locations makes it really statistically unlikely uh, that at least one will receive a usable signal am amplitude. I hope you can see that as I switch them back and forth. Um, and high-end receivers, they're so good at this that they can usually tolerate quite a bit of signal degradation before one side drops out and amazing levels of degradation before completely dropping out. Um, but we try to avoid having combined diversity A or combined diversity B antennas, both within close, close range to the transmitter that they're intending to receive. Um, and I'm going to expand on this later, but we can insert attenuation on individual antenna inputs to manipulate the signal strength at each one, uh, which also manipulates where in space a dropout might occur. Uh, and because it manipulates that overlapping relationship of the combined signals. Uh, and I should also mention that we can also switch inputs on or off to best receive in a given situation where the, when the transmitter has moved. Uh, and we'll talk about that again as well. Um, so since one of our major goals is to maximize each antenna's coverage within its zone while minimizing its overlap with other zones, we should be pretty familiar with various antennas properties. Uh, I mean, we really should anyway, but with DAS, it becomes very important. Uh, so just some basics to start with. Uh, antenna properties are reciprocal. Uh, that, that means that the gain and pattern apply equally to transmit and receive applications. Uh, the an antenna doesn't care whether it's, sent, uh, whether it's emitting energy or whether it's uh, transducing energy from space into a cable. Um, you could think of gain and transmit as loudness and gain and receive as sensitivity, uh, but they're really both the same thing to an antenna. Uh, it's also important to make the distinction, uh, active antennas in, in, you know, pro audio products, they're actually a system of two distinct components. 
it's an antenna and it's an amplifier. And one reason that some active antennas uh, or some, the reason that sometimes we won't choose an active antenna is because we can't insert uh, external filters or attenuation between the antenna and the amp. They're permanently connected together. And between the antenna and the amp is where those filters and attenuation do the most good. And we're gonna expand on that a bit as well. Uh, not right away. <laughs> Uh, so when we talk about antenna gain and patterns, you know, we, uh, we, all, we often express these as a polar plot. In fact, that's pretty much what you always see in a, a manufacturer specification. Uh, and it's identical to how we describe microphones and loudspeakers, and, and it means the same thing. Uh, it's an expression of gain uh, versus angle expressed as a plot. Uh, and, and again, all reputable antenna, antenna manufacturers publish this information for, for all their products. Uh, and you should use that information to select and place your antennas the same way we do microphones. Uh, another example, like uh, placing a piano mic for maximum pick, pickup of the piano while having to reject a nearby horn section. Uh, so, of course, uh, lower frequencies mean bigger antennas, higher frequencies, smaller antennas. And this is a factor because when a production doesn't want them to be visible to the audience and, you know, it actually has happened to me where they didn't want the talent to see the microphones, which uh, the, uh, to see the antennas, uh, which is pretty rough because line of sight is best practice, <laughs> literally. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, they, they don't want to see them. So if you're using VHF, you got this big old antenna to hide. Uh, and, and as we go forward and we're looking at these antenna specs, uh, gain in DBD is uh, decibels relative to a dipole or reference to a dipole. Uh, and DBI is reference to a theoretical antenna called an isotropic. And uh, isotropic is like a perfect 360 degree 3D sphere omnidirectional with zero dB gain in all directions. Uh, it can exist in reality. Uh, it's impossible, but it's a good imaginary reference. Uh, and just because I'm a nerd, the difference between those two, dBD and dB, dBi, is 2.1 decibels. <laughs> um, so, Moving a little further along the idea of the polar pattern of an antenna, uh, antenna beam width is often misunderstood. Uh, and uh, even among RF professionals, uh, we disagree on how to best interpret it and apply it. And I think part of the reason for that is, is because when, when we're trying to express that to, to people we're talking to, we're trying to set up rules of some thumb for people. We're, you know, we're trying to make it simple. Uh, and the problem is, is it's not simple. So you're, you may hear conflicting opinions about how to interpret this for your use, but this is my take. Uh, and this first part is just the truth, no matter what you believe. Uh, it's uh, antenna beam width of a directional antenna is the angle in degrees off of the axis of, high of highest gain. And it's actually times two. Uh, because it's, you can see in the graphics, it's, it's times two. Uh, and that's the point, that's the angle at which it drops to three dB lower than the highest gain. And this is important to understand. Uh, in pro audio, even the tightest commonly used directional antenna patterns, they don't drop off radically past the beam width. It's gradual. You know, different antennas, it's steeper than others, but it's gradual. But understand, if you have a 12 dB gain antenna with a 70 degree beam width, such as like a CP beam or a heel, uh, professional wireless helical, gain at 35 degrees off the center will still be plus 9 dB, which is actually 3 dB hotter than a paddle on axis. Uh, so like if your receiver position, if you're a monitor engineer and you've got a, a in-ear pack on, 
if you're 20 feet away from a helical transmit antenna, you should still receive plenty of signal, more than 60 degrees off axis. It's not like it disappears when you step outside of 35 degrees. So we wanna choose an antenna, knowing all that stuff, we wanna choose an antenna that has a pattern that best serves the space. Uh, it's, and you should know, it's perfectly okay to superimpose a polar pattern graphic that you've nabbed from the manufacturer over a scale drawing of your performance space to try to anticipate how well it will cover. Uh, I use paint.net freeware uh, and uh, back in the day I used uh, uh, Photoshop back when I had a license for an old version. Uh, and it's best if these programs do let you work in transparent layers. That way you can overlay things and move them around and scale the layers independently. Uh, because you can scale your antenna polar pattern up and down to fit your path loss calculations. And we're gonna talk about that soon. Uh, and uh, uh, you can then turn them and move them. Uh, you can change the location of the antenna, the angle of the antenna, and that'll give you some good insight as to selecting the best one. So let's look at how the antennas available to us in Pro Audio differ from each other in gain patterns. Uh, a simple whip is called a monopole. Uh, it's highly dependent on whatever it's attached to to function well. It, it needs a, a, a counterpoise, it's called, but it's a metal, metal object that it's connected to. Uh, and it, the pattern of this antenna drastically changes based on the shape of what it's connected to. Uh, but a true monopole has a toroid or a fat donut pattern. Uh, it, it's not quite spherical and it has deep dimples at each end of the pole. Uh, also, most high-end pro audio whips are actually more complex than what they look like. And many of those are actually tuned dipoles. Um, and I'll show you dipole in a minute. Uh, uh, but all antenna patterns, you could fairly say that they are distortions of this shape. Uh, some are mild, some are extreme, but it's like, it's like a, a, a semi-inflated balloon that you can squeeze and, and manipulate. Uh, when you squeeze it on one side, meaning less gain on that side, it'll bulge out on the other, meaning more gain on the other side. And when I switch this graphic now, you'll see these are variants of that shape. They've been, they've been squeezed around. So omnidirectional antennas are generally considered to be low gain. When somebody says a low gain antenna, they usually, usually, not always, usually mean a, a, an omni. Uh, and it usually means zero to three dB a gain. Uh, the first one, a ground plane, plane Sputnik, we called them Sput Sputniks back in the day. Uh, Future Sonics in-ear monitors came with these antennas. Uh, they have a bowl-like pattern with the highest gain radially from their axis, but tilted up conically away from its pseudo ground plane elements. Um, dipoles have a slightly squashed donut pattern uh, with the highest gain radial outward from their physical axis. Uh, I should mention that the Sennheiser A1031U that looks like the, a, a, a boat oar, that's a dipole. Uh, the horizontal element of the diversity fin is a dipole that's tilted 90 degrees to its uh, paddle element. Um, and the bottom one is a disc own. They're common outside of pro audio. They, uh, radio scanner people like them or, or uh, CB radio base stations, they like them. Uh, and it has a real complex pattern of nested bowls, like on a dinner plate. Um, so directional antennas are generally considered to be high gain. Uh, the LPDAs, our, our paddles or shark fins, have a pattern that's very close to a cardioid microphone. Uh, it is slightly squashed from above and below, and it has about five to six dB, dBi of gain on axis. Um, hemispherical spirals have more of a wide cardioid pattern and they have very good rear rejection. Uh, and they have about eight dB, eight dBi again on axis. Um, and then our helicals have hypercardioid pattern with around 12 dBi of gain. 
Uh, and it's almost uncanny just how close the helical pattern is to a small diaphragm condenser hypercardioid. Uh, if you put those polar plots side by side, I've seen them, they've, they're almost identical, uh, including the narrow hot lobe sticking straight out the back. So again, as audio people, it's nice. It's actually a nice coincidence that all these antennas, their patterns look just like microphones. And then there's specialty antennas. Uh, they run the gamut of wild variations. Uh, uh, and, and this is a good time to mention that antenna designs, like everything else in RF, are a collection of compromises that are designed to satisfy specific user goals. Uh, one user may place more value on the antenna being compact or easy to deploy uh, as long as the performance is within tolerance. Uh, another user may need extreme durability because it's a harsh environment. Uh, of course, the big one is cost. Everything's got to fit a budget. Uh, and here in these special antenna, uh, specialty antennas, uh, I want you to notice the low gain RS spotlight antenna at the bottom. Uh, in DAS, uh, it can sometimes be very beneficial to deploy more low gain antenna zones of small size, small zones, rather than having fewer high gain zones where a big area is covered, uh, especially in very noisy RF environments, uh, you know, either because of a nearby high power transmission, you know, you're near the TV antenna farm on the hill, uh, or because of a high number of lower power transmissions, like you're in a, a convention center with 400 microphones. Uh, and this takes advantage of the inverse square law of wave propagation through space to increase the carrier noise ratio of the most closely located microphone transmitter. So that's an advantage we can use later when we're planning our zones. Uh, so placing your antennas, it's almost always complicated by aesthetics. You know, you've got to compromise. Uh, but sometimes you can't let yourself be backed into a corner where your system doesn't work. You know, sometimes you got to step up and, and kind of fight to, to get your design accepted. Uh, and if we know our antenna properties well, it's a lot easier to decide when that battle is worth fighting and when it's not. You know, if we really understand, maybe we can make a change that makes the producer happier or, or our installation client happier. Uh, maybe not. Maybe this is the only place we can put the thing. Um, but once you know, you know. Uh, so we want to at least try to treat each zone as a separate performance space, regardless of their levels of isolation between each other. We want to try. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we want diversity A and B patterns to overlap each other within a zone. And for spatial diversity systems, uh, we want to locate our A and B antennas as far apart as is practical, but always more than one wavelength apart, which, which is around two feet for UHF. Um, so, we, next slide, okay. So transmit to receive antenna placement. You've got in-ears on one antenna and you've got a pair of diversity antennas on receive. This is another area where all the experts don't agree. Uh, and again, we, we agree on why we do it the way we do it, but we don't necessarily agree on how to m set a simple rule of thumb. So, uh, but again, we want transmit and receive to be placed as far apart as possible even when they operate in different frequency bands. Yes, we can get away with having them closer to each other when they're different bands, but best practice is to separate them as much as we can. It's crucial that you place the transmit antennas in the pattern nulls of the re receive antennas and vice versa. You want them at angles to each other in placement. I don't mean in aiming, but in placement, where they lie in each other's uh, weakest directions of gain. Uh, and and it's, it's my humble preference to not place 
transmit and receives directly on access to each other in line with each other ever even when you even when your polar pattern predicts that the deepest null is directly behind the antenna i find that offset of 30 to 60 degrees to the back axis is usually most effective and the reason why i think Polar patterns, they're averaged and smoothed. It makes measurement easier and the calculation of it more manageable. Uh, and it makes the, the polar pattern more intuitive for viewers, you know, for, for you to look at and have it make sense to you. Uh, real life patterns can be spikier than the published patterns. And uh, my experience leads me to believe that, that the likelihood of spikes of higher gain is greatest directly behind the antenna. It's just, I've had, too many instances where, where a, a client had me troubleshoot a problem, I come in and we got to transmit directly in line with a receive. So that's my feeling there. Um, so sometimes you're going to be in a situation where it's beneficial to cover an extremely large area with multiple zones that aren't physically isolated. Uh, or, or our transmitter power isn't su sufficient to cover the desired range. Uh, you know, it could be a complex of, soc of multiple soccer fields, uh, a golf course, a parade route, uh, even a front of house satellite stage on a music tour. Uh, or it could be areas uh, that are separate rooms, but the isolation of the walls isn't high enough to, uh, to be truly separate where the walls are only moderately RF opaque. You know, the, and the isolation, the lack of isolation is enough to ca cause problems. Uh, so I've found that it's, it's better to avoid symmetrical deployments of your antennas, meaning putting an antenna uh, of, antennas of equal gain at each of the four corners of a rectangle. Uh, I find that it's better to make them asymmetrical to the space uh, because the, the location where destructive interference to the signal is most likely to occur is halfway between two combined antennas. So here in this drawing, we have two A's, two B's. They're com the A's are combined, the A's combined to A, B is combined to B. Halfway between those antennas is your area where you're most likely to have multipath interference occur. So by making this deployment asymmetrical, we've moved that likely area of dropout so that it doesn't converge. So if someone does step into the null of a B, the A is still functioning. Uh, I hope that's clear. Um, so. And that would be what we call defeating diversity. Your diversity can no longer work. Um, we can also manipulate where the overlap occurs by selecting antennas of different gain or different patterns or by inserting attenuation. Uh, attenuation effects, effectively shrinks an antenna's coverage so you could tailor it to the desired space. Uh, you could use fixed value attenuators. Uh, you could calculate the loss of each cable's length and use different length cables to introduce attenuation. Uh, and then one of the reasons to have a nice active uh, DAS head end is because uh, they, might, they might offer variable or stepped attenuation, which you can step through and very carefully uh, or, or very finely control your antenna overlaps. Um, so it's really handy to move that overlap away from where you think the performers are going to spend the, the most amount of their time. Uh, and you can do it on the fly. You can also use on off switching for the individual antennas to make the system suit the exact moment in a performance. Uh, extremely handy to have that in your DAS. Uh, and again, this is something I've said before. You could think of your DAS head end as a mixing console. 
you don't necessarily want all of your inputs wide open at all times. You can mix and mute to minimize noise and maximize CNR. So RF filters are crucial to proper operation of our systems. They're inside many stages of a well-designed system in some form or other, uh, including internally and in all the high quality equipment that you, uh, like your receivers, uh, there's filtering in uh, antenna multicouplers. Uh, so you usually don't have to think about it. Uh, excuse me, let me take a drink. But since internal X, uh, uh, but since uh, external antenna distribution products must be widely adaptable for different users and different appli app applications, uh, they're usually really wideband devices. Uh, and so they can benefit from inserting external filtering chosen for what you needed to do. Uh, I've mentioned it before, filters are most effective when they're inserted before any active stages in the signal path. And usually that's immediately after your receive antenna. Uh, of course, it can be at the opposite end of the cable, but you want it to be inserted before the first amplification or active stage. Uh, and it's interesting, antennas themselves can be designed or tuned to somewhat act as filters where they'll intentionally reject undesired frequency ranges while being very as sensitive as possible to desired ranges. Um, the uh, uh, Sennheiser uh, 5000 CP, uh, it has a uh, meh re reception gain and performance below 500 megahertz, but an advantage is, is that can help to reject your walkie-talkie two-way radios blast in between 450 and 470 megahertz. So that's a good example of that. Uh, uh, and, and filter specs can be interpreted uh, exactly the same way uh, as uh, audio frequency filters and crossovers. Uh, the only difference is the decimal places in frequency. Uh, they, you can read their specs just like you read specs on audio filtering. Um, I also want to mention, uh, I always recommend bandpass filters uh, inserted between antennas, uh, receive antennas and RF over fiber sending units. Uh, RF over fiber units, it's so easy to blow them up. It's so easy to overload them. Filters really help with that. Uh, you can use fixed frequency sp filters. They're, they're inexpensive, they're simple, they're small, uh, they're very effective. Uh, they do require you to have a band plan for your frequency coordination because you'll have to place all your microphones within this band pass. Uh, the system won't function correctly if you try to tune outside of that. Uh, and then there's more complex filters out there. They can be bulky, heavy, expensive. Uh, they can really help when, you, when your environment is very RF noisy uh, or if your system has lots of RF inputs you know, like a television studio complex or a university campus that's all interconnected. Uh, you know, when your system gets to a certain size, these kind of filters can really be the difference between perfect performance and total failure. So they're worth the money. Um, so the meat of the matter with filters. Most of us, you know, we understand that all of the space in the universe is permeated by electromagnetic waves, meaning radio. They're all traveling at very near the speed of light, uh, which we nerds call C. Uh, they originate from all directions. They have different propagation polarizations and they oscillate at every imaginable frequency at all different amplitudes and polarities. But at many points inside our electronics, the total sum of all signals entering our antennas becomes a single, very complex waveform that's just a variance of amplitude over time. And that signal is known as the vector sum of every electromagnetic wave that our antenna and transmission line has transduced into voltage and power. This calculation simulation graphic shows on its top half here. Hope you guys can see my cursor. 
uh, a complex waveform that is the vector sum of the discrete power section shown in its bottom half. That bottom half is a representation of what you'd see on an RF spectrum analyzer, and it shows nine discrete RF carriers at different frequencies rising above an arbitrary fixed noise floor at differing amplitudes. Every change in one of these represents a proportional change in the other. Um, these are inexplicably linked, these two representations of the same thing. Uh, here, all we've done is compress the amplitude of the complex waveform shown at the top. And look, the resulting noise across the power uh, spectrum, it's severe. And it's revealed as extreme noise all across our measured frequency span. Our discrete carriers are now buried in noise. Uh, this compression is what happens when linear RF amplifiers are driven into overload and they become nonlinear. They, they can no longer accurately amplify just the amplitude of the input signal true to the original waveform. And this is probably why RF engineers, they often call noise distortion. It's distortion of that waveform. So it's a little different than how we how audio guys will refer to distortion as, as a clipping of individual frequencies. This has other, uh, see audio, audio amplification doesn't need to be as strictly linear as RF amplification does to still function So, when our DAS combines multiple antenna inputs and also likely splits out to many receivers, these dem demands for linearity can get pretty extreme because we're talking about lots of amplification to make up for lots of combine and split stages. Uh, and once again, the head end can behave much like an audio mixing console with every mic wide open. The resulting mix is full of unnecessary and undesirable information that the system must work to reproduce. But filtering solves this. Filtering removes unnecessary and undesired energy from the system before it has a chance to enter and overstress our active components. Here, all we've done is insert a bandpass filter that allows our desired frequencies to pass while blocking the undesired stuff. And you can immediately see that by simply blocking out the outer two carriers on each end, just the outer two carriers on each end, you can see the waveform is less complex and far lower in amplitude. Uh, our active stages that amplify now have to ha they have drastically lower demands to satisfy. Uh, and real, in real life, that demand can be orders of magnitude of difference. Uh, uh, and, and also in a DAS, again, multiple inputs, they aggregate multiple small inefficiencies into big ones for the whole system. So filtering is critical. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning, uh, even when this behavior is less dra drastic than these examples, uh, uh, on individual inputs in a real system, uh, the thresholds for linearity and RF circuitry, those thresholds can represent a very abrupt and fine distinction between tolerable performance and complete failure. Like, RF amplifiers, you get up to a certain amount of input power, everything's fine. You just barely get over that threshold and everything goes nuts. Uh, I mean, a single zone antenna in a small DAS uh, can throw an entire rig into overload when one five watt walkie talkie keys up. And those things are outside of our operational frequency bands. We can filter those out. 
uh, and that can instantly squash the depth. The mic signal over 100 megahertz away in a completely different zone on the other end of campus because these zones are all connected now with, with our DAS system. So if you don't want to find out where those distinctions are waiting to mess you up, you know, in the middle of Sunday service or during a sports ball world championship broadcast, filters are really good insurance. So now that we've all completely mastered the rocket surgery brain science that is radio frequency engineering, uh, I just want to briefly talk about one final and very important aspect of DAS that's about frequency coordination. So the most popular coordination software programs out there that we use in our industry, uh, they allow users to virtually place different devices in different zones for the purpose of calculation. Uh, it's really crucial that we don't equate DAS zones with frequency coordination zones as defined by those programs. Uh, frequency coordination zones assume that each zone is a sufficiently isolated from other zones so that they only, so that only direct hits of duplicate frequencies within certain occupied channel bandwidths, uh, it, it doesn't let them directly hit each other. They're, they're prohibited. Um, it, uh, now, uh, I should mention wireless workbench, it, it now lets users manipulate that concept, but you got to tread carefully there and really understand what you're doing. Um, but generally, uh, with, with default settings, the math predicts that internet intermodulation products generated within one coordinate, coordination zone uh, won't be strong enough to interfere with channels in any other coordination zone. Uh, so it isolates the zones between each other by allowing an assigned frequency to coincide with a calculated intermod frequency from another zone. Uh, and now a, a DAS defeats that isolation between the zones because each receiver intentionally receives useful signals from all the DAS zones loud and clear. Uh, so we got to anticipate that any IMD products, intermodulation products generated in, in one DAS zone uh, that's of sufficient strength to interfere with channels within that zone they'll be faithfully received by the system as if it's all one giant frequency coordination zone. So uh, I hope that's clear. Uh, it, it, it would be a shame to go through all this work to design our system so well and have it come down to the fact, uh, have a failure come down to the fact that zones are named the same thing, but mean different things between our software and our hardware. So I felt it was important to mention that. Um, so anyway, that really, I, I hope, gives you the, the overall, uh, the overall understanding of, of each of these factors that are so important as we build our DAS. As we take this simple system of just an AMD diversity receive system and we start adding to it. Okay, now it's a, it, we start with diversity system. Now we're going to combine two diversity antenna systems into the same diversity receiver. And we'll do that three times. Uh, I've built systems as large as eight eight diversity zones, so 16 antenna paths entering the system. Uh, but all of these concepts we talked about, they apply to small DAS systems, even if it's a two zone. And almost all of this stuff is just best practices for wireless in general. Uh, and having these, uh, uh, the understanding of these individual concepts, I hope helps you in the future. Um, so that's what I've got for you today. I, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, again, I, I, I hope everyone's safe 
and comfortable and your families are well. So uh, uh, I'm ready to take some questions. Maybe I shouldn't have ended there so quickly. I'm ready to take your questions and uh, we can go over some more of this stuff in more detail if you like. So uh, uh, Chris, 